So today um, we're going to finish up uh, lecture four and we're going to talk about posts. The big part about posts isn't actually the post itself um, as much as there's design involved in that. Um, most of the time the base building engineer or the engineer you hire isn't designing the post itself. That's usually a fabricated item that you pick from a list and purchase. It's the base, it's the foundation, um, and sometimes even the connection from of the post to the foundation is part of the engineer's scope. Um, so we're gonna talk about what that looks like. Um, this is just a short, quick one, because there's not a lot of um, kind of design sensibility in it. It's mostly a very practical um, uh, thing. And it's, it's, it's interesting because I find that um, it's often in the scope of landscape architects, um, uh, which can on large projects just be the base, the, the regular architects or the building architects scope as well. Um, so you might not even be intended to be a landscape architect um, and there are landscape elements that fall into your scope. Um, and often firms just have a typical detail, the same way we have typical detail, that they plop on their drawings and they've been there forever and no one's ever really thought about it, uh, but they don't work structurally. Um, and if you don't let the engineer know that you need a design or if you don't hire an engineer to design it, that's not gonna meet the building code requirements. Um, so I find I often at the very last minute get a phone call from architects saying, we have light posts and basketball posts and other types of posts that we need designed ASAP. Sometimes they've already even been built and I have to tell them if they work or not. Um, and sometimes they don't and we have to kind of come up with some way to make it work. Um, so what I'm trying to do is have you avoid all of that headache and all of those problems by showing you what, what the normal intent is right away on the drawings. So you're at least drawing something that's reasonable from the get-go on your projects. So the main components for designing these, there's obviously the self-weight. So there'd be um, the post itself would have a weight. Often they have a flag or a light on it. The light's going to cantilever out and there's going to be some dead load due to the weight of the light. That would come from um, a set of brochures. You're also gonna, often going to hear the, um, the base building engineer ask for the cut sheet. The cut sheet is the sheet that gives them all of this information. The really big thing that's on that list is something called the EPA value or the effective projected area. So um, what, what these people that sell these have to do is they actually have to have tests done, they have to have had an analysis done. Often they get like wind chamber testing done for their product. Um, and the studies show that even though it's got whatever its projected area is, the, the wind drag on it has been calculated to be something bigger. And so that gets given to that where it's usually right on a chart um, and if they have 10 products, they'll have, here's our stuff, here's the weight, here's how long it can leave out, here's the EPA. Um, but the engineer can't do much for the design without that info. So if you're asking an, in, an engineer to design the, uh, the foundation for a light post, you need to find them or at least direct them or tell them what brand you're using so that they can look up the EPA. Remember that an engineer has no cost for uh, built into their budget for kind of tracking down information and um, kind of controlling the flow of information, but the architect does. So it would be expected that the architect would find the cut sheet and hand it to the engineer so that the engineer can do the actual engineering, not, not hunting down the information. Um, so there's the effective projected area from whatever the object you're holding up is. Um, there's also the post itself and how the post gathers wind depends on its shape. Obviously it has its own projected area, but it also causes vortexes and, and um, it causes weird things happening around it. And those can be dependent on its shape. Again, you guys don't have to calculate this, but I wanted to show you the image um, that gives us our CF factor. So this would be instead of what we would normally have as our CP factor in our wind calculation. Um, 
and it gives us those based on its height to width ratio and also what kind of surface it is. Um, so this will be dependent on if it's a round surface, if it's kind of like um, faceted sides, because you can imagine that that changes the way the wind tries to flow around the post. Um, if, if these are big enough, they'll, uh, the, the headlight or the, the lamp kind of hanging, cantilevering off the side could pick up snow as well. If your post is a fence post, and we're not talking like a chain link one, which would still gather some wind load. If you're talking about a wood fence, um, there's going to be uh, uh, wind on it, like a wall. So we've seen this, this kind of wind slide a couple times for um, the other sides of bridges and our guards, uh, where it looks at essentially the, the, the surface area of your element and provides a, a force coefficient CF for walls that, that vary depending on its height to width uh, or height to length ratio. So we can have live loads as well um, de and depending on what it is. So I'm kind of lumping all posts into this and I don't necessarily know what your final application would be for it. Um, but I do know one great example where there's live loads, and that's basketball nets. Um, so basketball nets would have wind on the surface. Um, often that, it doesn't, sometimes they'll have an EPA, but often I've treated those as a wind wall, kind of more in this shape factor, but with some height above the ground. Um, basketball nets, though, tend to have a breakaway load. So they're doing it to preserve the basketball net, but it also preserves the structure. So if somebody hangs on the side of the net, it will, at a certain load, release and break away and then come back to its original shape. The idea here is that rather than break the board, that release mechanism lets go, releases the load, basically a person falls off, um, but you haven't damaged the entire system. So for the supplier, that would be the actual backing and how it's screwed into the backing. Um, but it also means that even if a uh, five people hang off the basketball net, we don't have to design for five people because the net would snap down prior to five people actually being able to hang off of it. Um, these are often called a fail-safe. Um, uh, we will employ them sometimes on fabric structures, although it's really hard to detail a fail-safe. Surprisingly difficult, um, especially for higher loads and variable regions. Um, but basketball nets that just have one load that they have to worry about for a person hanging off the end of the rim, um, they have a very reliable breakaway load. And it's one kilonewton, the, kind of the same, you know, kind of basic load that we've talked about for live load cases. Uh, serviceability, there's not really any criteria that I know of for uh, posts. Um, you could take a look and make sure that it's not moving in some ridiculous amount. If you have a post really close to a building, um, you don't want it to bash up against the building, so you'd need to take a look at that criteria. Um, but that would really be about context. So sometimes it's really important to understand where your thing is in the world and what what the implications of too much deflection, uh, the, Im the impact that could have on your structure or adjacent structures. Maybe there's some criteria for what it's holding up as well. Um, I can think of um, police cameras, for example. Um, they might have a tighter uh, criteria for serviceability because if they were deflecting too much, it would shake the um, the uh, camera elements within it. Again, I'm just guessing here, I haven't done one of those designs, but I'm trying to think of places where serviceability outside of the normal, we don't really have any for posts, might come into play. And where you might need to stop and ask yourself the question, should I have service, serviceability requirements on this? Again, vibration, there are vibration requirements for poles and posts and light standards. Um, because vortex shedding can kind of start to make them um, go like, uh, like be really annoying, actually. Um, one of the ones that I always like to think about, it's not, it wasn't the pole itself, but um, 
there was a, uh, a light pole in um, the parking lot of a grocery store by, by where I used to live. And they had a, a cable going down the side of it. I'm assuming it was to help them facilitate changing the light bulb. And there was something about that one that when the wind would blow by, it would excite the cable. And the cable would, it made this almost humming and rattling sound simultaneously. Um, the post itself was fine, but it's just to show you how vortex shedding can actually cause a vibration problem because that vortex shedding around the post was exciting the cable that was pulled down beside it. Um, this wouldn't normally be in the scope of the base building engineer. Often for these sort of products, even though they do engineering, they often have to do, um, if you're selling mass quantities of these things, you often, it's in your best interest to actually do um, wind testing analysis. So they would probably actually build prototypes and hire um, uh, a wind tunnel company to actually test their product to see the, uh, the effects of wind on it. And sometimes it might allow them to actually reduce the amount of material. They might find they have a vibration problem, um, but it helps kind of refine the process. So like I said, the posts are usually designed by the supplier. Um, if you're doing a wood fence, no, probably not. That would be designed by the engineer. Um, uh, but usually that's probably going to be a four by four post for kind of a regular fence. Um, that's, you know, four feet high, uh, spanning four meters or something in that range, maybe even up to six. Um, if you're going to a bigger fence, yeah, you're probably looking at uh, uh, six by six posts. Otherwise, the post itself is usually supplied by the, uh, and engineered by the fabricator or supplier as well. Um, the engineer is designing the foundations to resist the overturning of that load and making sure we've met the requirements of the uh, geotechnical report. Um, so that would include making sure we don't allow, that we don't allow frosty, so going down the required amount for frost, which we know in uh, southern Ontario, uh, including Toronto area, is going down four feet below grade. So here's a free body diagram of a light post, for example. We would have the dead load from the weight of the light. You can imagine if we used our, uh, our, our right hand rule, a load's trying to cause our element to spin in this direction. We've got a dead load from the pole itself, kind of right in line here. There'd be the EP hay from the light or the flag. I've drawn it in that direction just because I'm drawing a 2D section. This would probably be a load case where it's going in and out of the page. For the practicality purposes of this analysis, this is fine. And then there'd be the wind on the pole as a linear uh, line. If this pole was long enough, we might have our EC vary, and which is our effective height factor. We might see this value start to increase. but most poles are going to be kind of within the range of 0.9 to 1 CE. Uh, so at the base, these are usually moment connected to something. The something is what we have to figure out. Um, so we would need a reaction in the X direction, we would need a reaction in the Y direction, and we would need some sort of moment resisting base. Um, so these would be the three reactions of this pole. But for what we're designing, these three values actually become our applied loads. So if I'm designing the base or the foundation for this, I'm going to have the reaction that was in the Y direction actually acting as a load for me on my post. The reaction that was in the X direction is now my load in the X direction. And that moment that was about resisting the overturning is what's being applied to my sauna tube. Now, we need to make sure these things go down four feet for frost. But the typical construction for resisting the loads for poles is a sauna tube or a caisson. When I first started, we were often told, or it was industry standard, to say the top two feet of soil could be disturbed by somebody, you know, planting a garden or uh, putting a tree in there or doing something 
to uh, disturb the soil. And if the soil, if this post is in the ground, and what we want is to stop it tipping over because it's bearing against the, the ground, we dig a big hole right here. We don't have any soil resisting the load there. So they used to say the top two feet don't count on that to resist your load. That's changed in the past few years. Most soils reports I see now say four feet to the point that I make that my standard now. You know, you might have a geotechnical engineer that says, yeah, you can only use two, but if something happened um, and you had the experience of knowing that most of them are the top four feet could be disturbed, um, you'd be hard pressed to rationalize why it was okay on that one. So I just make it my policy, the top four feet of soil could be disturbed by somebody mucking about in that water there, or in that soil there. So we have our downward load being resisted by bottom bearing of our sauna tube. So it's some circle pushing down on the ground. We have friction along the sides of our sauna tube as well. Uh, our force in this direction, we have friction from the side, from it pushing against the soil. Um, but then because it's overturning, it's going to say its peak is here and it's going to disappear down and then the bottom is kicking out. So we've got bearing resistance of the soil back here too. And we need to make sure that this load doesn't overload our soil capacity at these points. So we need to make sure it doesn't slide, we need to make sure it doesn't overturn, we need to make sure it doesn't sink down into the ground based on the soil capacity. Um, we can, if we have, um, you know, big rocks down here, or maybe you have services right here, um, we can do uh, foundations, we can do spread footings, what we're used to seeing. Um, so this would be some sort of square based footing, or maybe it's a strip because you have a series of these light posts. Um, we resist our gravity um, in bearing on the bottom. We have um, uh, this, the, the friction of the footing along the soil uh, for our X direction. And overturning gets resisted in bearing along the bottom of the footing. So you can see this becomes um, a really important uh, uh, value right here, the bearing resistance of the soil. We also have to worry about this possibly kicking up. So we need to make sure that we don't, even though this might be strong enough to resist the loads, it might not resist the loads until it actually starts to move. So we need to check that as well. Um, we get to include the weight of the concrete in helping um, resist that thing from tipping over. We can also include um, the weight of this soil uh, to help us resist those loads. Um, we need to be down still four feet for frost. Now, I find architects who don't like the sauna tubes, and these tend to go down two to three meters. Um, it depends on the soil condition, the soil type, the soil capacity, what our loads are. Um, they get really freaked out by how long these are or how deep they go down. And they always say, well, can't we just use a spread footing? The spread footings are much bigger for these lamp posts. Um, the overturning forces are quite high and we don't have anything kind of bracing the top of it. So normally when we have spread and strip footings, it's connected to a building. Um, so we're not often dealing with an overturning force. We're just dealing with a gravity force. Um, the second you do this, your footing needs to get much bigger. Um, so I find once I show architects this option, they always go back to the sauna tube option if they can. We would only do this if there's a reason we can't do the sauna tube. So I'm going to show you um, a few drawing examples just so you can kind of see the practical things. Um, there's not a lot of beautiful lamppost images to show you guys, so I just have some kind of practical images after that, um, just to kind of give you a sense of what these things look like. So this was a project I did um, for ERA. I probably should add who the, uh, the architect is. Um, so they do a lot of heritage stuff, um, 
Uh, and they've been doing kind of a lot of restorations of parks and things like that. And they've been having a lot of these kind of small projects pop up that they don't need an engineer for the main project. Um, and then they realize they have a few small discrete elements that they, they ask me to help participate in. Um, sometimes it also includes a canopy or a pergola. Um, but often there are tall things embedded in the ground. So this particular project had three of those things. There was a, I can't see this. I have to look at this. The basketball net, the, the, the 10 foot fence posts on a tube. So this was a 10 foot fence. And then they had an outdoor table saw tube. So all of these were designed. So these ones, um, this was a couple years ago where the information I was still reliably getting was saying only two feet down for frost. So these now I would probably say um, would go down a little bit farther. It doesn't make that much of a, a difference. They probably, uh, this one might have been 2.4 meters and this one might have been 2.5 or 2.6 meters. Um, basketball posts often come long enough or they have extenders on them so that the moment goes all the way down to the base using the pole. So it is its own reinforcing. Um, it gets embedded in the concrete and the concrete is just distributing the load from the post to the soil. So it doesn't need any extra reinforcing because it is being reinforced by the post itself. So that would be the case. These fence posts were being custom made. So same deal. This was a supplier designed um, outdoor table. So they come in wood or metal um, and they often have three sides around them and one is open to allow accessibility. So somebody in a wheelchair or in a, a walker, uh, like a seated walker can come up and still access the table with their family. Um, these had point load requirements that caused overturning. Um, these ones did not extend down. They didn't come with the ability to extend down. So this one needed reinforcing within the concrete so that the concrete down here could still be distributing the load into the soil. If we left that unreinforced, that's great. The post works, it transfers the load in right here, but our concrete would break right there because it's trying to put the concrete in bending. And we know that concrete, for something to be in bending, one side's in tension, one side's in compression, and concrete with no steel in it is absolute crap without steel in it for tension. It'll just fail, it doesn't work, it has no capacity and tension. So if we don't have reinforcing in there, the tension side of the concrete and bending would fail. So we need steel in there to get all the way down. These ones solved the problem by using the actual steel post to go all the way down. Um, this one would need reinforcing in there to do that job. So here's an image um, of, that, of that court. I really like that it had all three things kind of uh, uh, embedded in it. They never told me about this light post, so I don't even know what was done for this. This wasn't included in my scope. Um, I did give them information about this bench. Uh, I did the basketball nets and I did this, this 10 foot fence and these here. This, I'll show you why they might not have needed me for this one and I'll show you that in a few slides. It's something that I've been seeing come up on projects lately. So here's another project with ERA um, that I did at around almost the same time. So this was Gordon Ridge Sports Court. Um, again, this is when I was still getting information that the top two feet of soil um, only needed to be considered as being disturbed. That's now normally four feet where the, the standard, the industry standard has started to change in that respect. Um, this one is a basketball net by a supplier that wasn't extending all the way down. It might have been the case, I can't remember which one came first, um, that they had been using a supplier that showed the post going all the way down. Um, but then on that other project, um, when they actually, it actually came time to it, they didn't have um, the posts going all the way down. So they contacted me and I issued um, a verbal, a written site instruction without an act updating the drawings, saying what the reinforcing needed to be for that. So here's one 
that the post didn't go all the way down and we did need steel reinforcing. This one's a lot bigger than the other project. If you look here, there's the basketball net size. So not the net, not that's, in, that's a standard set by basketball rules, um, but the actual board behind it. Um, and that is, like I said, picking up wind. So that's why I always include what size board these things have been designed for, because it made a big difference. You can imagine that's a big load up at the top, um, causing the most moment. So the further away that load is, um, and the bigger the surface area, the more moment we're going to have on our post base. Um, this one also had um, a racket net um, uh, sauna tube condition as well. Here is a, another project. This is one that I was doing and I wanted to show you because I designed the posts. This was a fence, but it wasn't your normal fence. So normally fences um, are four feet tall and are usually the posts are four to six feet. Um, this one was, God, let me check. Seven feet tall. So I don't even I don't even know how they were able to get away with that because I didn't think you were allowed to build fences six feet tall. So they must have had to apply for um, oh my God, what do you apply for? Variance. Variance. Thank you. <laughs> um, a variance to allow the taller fence, um, but they also, in some conditions, had the fence sitting very close to the property line up high. Um, so there was actually um, a retaining aspect happening here. So most of the time, we would just do a sauna tube. I remember Jennifer was floored by the need of these sauna tubes. And I pointed out that if she was doing a four-foot fence that was only four to six feet tall, um, she wouldn't need me. She wouldn't need me to design it um, because there are standard details, uh, because that would technically meet the clauses in Part 9, and she could look up what what post base or what foundation to use for that. If I designed even that one, I would find that it doesn't work. But there's been enough of those built um, with very little detrimental effect that the industry has said, okay, as long as you do not do anything more than this, we'll let you build this to resist the loads. But the second you go beyond that, you need it engineered and you're gonna find it's much bit bigger than that. So this became um, kind of a much bigger element. Um, our fence post base needed to transfer that load into our sauna tube. So this is a rod cast in that as that overturning tries to happen, that tries to pull up out of the ground and the load is resisted in bearing on the concrete right here. Um, and then the top four feet don't even work for soil. So you can imagine if you take away 1,200 of this, you know, we're left with only less than a meter of this sauna tube doing the work for us. Um, so people look at these and think they're so deep, but I don't even get to use the top meter of it or the top 1.2 meters of it to resist my loads. Um, here's our retaining wall. Um, uh, we've got um, uh, this kind of resisting our, uh, our um, overturning. We've got weight of soil here to kind of help keep that down. But I just wanted to show you that both of these are supporting the same fence. Um, it's just that once we have kind of this grade differential, this is a continuous thing too. So these were discrete every eight feet, whereas this is a continuous element and then with the, the, the posts placed every eight feet. So I just wanted to show you some photos now that I found on the internet that just allow us to kind of see some of these, some of these things. It was you yawning, I thought it was Malcolm waking up. So here's what people build all the time. You know, you dig a bit of a hole, pour in some concrete, stick your post in and hope for the best. I've done that myself because honestly, the 
the code says I can do it for most of these things. This might not be an image exactly from our code. You'd want to look at your specific application. It's not part four, it would be in part nine or some other kind of standard details. Um, and it's not a life safety issue. It's more about practicality and serviceability and coming back and fixing your post in a few years. But honestly, wood fences last. They have like a 10 to 15 year lifespan anyway, um, just because the wood starts to rot and fall down. And um, so you often find yourself redoing these anyway. These ones did not go down far. So you can see about two feet for depth. Here's the problem. Here's frost heat. People think we're crazy when you say go down four feet for frost. Well, here's what you need to do. This is why we do it. Once the ice grabs the side of your thing and it freezes and expands, it can push that thing right up. Our sauna tubes um, in the top four feet where frost can be, they need to be smooth, smooth, smooth. Because even if we go down more than four feet, if that's rough and unfinished, that soil could still grab it and push it up as it freezes. This, this particular example here, um, the architect called me and was quite worried because they didn't use an auger to uh, make these holes. They actually dug down and used, um, um, hide, they used like injected water to kind of push the soil out. Um, and they wanted to know if that was okay. Well, the problem is, is that disturbs all kinds of soil here. Um, so what we needed is we need two things. We need to make sure this concrete fills the whole void or else it can't push against the soil that's there. So in the end, I told them that they needed all of this that was disturbed soil or removed soil to be filled with concrete, but they couldn't follow that thought process in the top four feet. In the top four feet, they needed to have still their formed sauna tube, and then they needed to backfill with free draining gravel so that the top four feet wouldn't be grabbed by ice and heave out, but then the bottom portion of it would be have would have concrete pushed tight against the soil. Um, I just wanted to show you kind of what we're trying to do in basketball nets. If anyone has their kind of home basketball net, um, when we bought our house, one of these was left on our property. And often these are filled with water and that water is acting as our, our counterweight to stop this from tipping over. Ours has no water in it and is indeed tipped over. Um, flagpoles, another common um, uh, post base. So I just wanted to show you kind of some standards. This one's, it was actually hard. When I Googled images of flagpoles and bases, all I found were like 500 images of the waving American flag, um, which I have no problem putting up here, except it had absolutely no context for what we're discussing at this point here. Um, so this was like the one sad little photo I could find, except for this one. Most flagpoles are, you know, 10 to 30, possibly even 40 feet. I have seen 60 in kind of the normal standard ones. This is a 400 foot flagpole. I'm assuming it's in Washington, D.C. is my rough guess. I can, I'm imagining it might be somewhere else, but that's, there was no context in it. Um, all of these are the anchors for it because as this thing is trying to tip over, the steel rods are trying to pull up out of the concrete. Um, here is the massive footing. It doesn't, didn't even show the footing they needed to resist these loads for overturning. Um, if these are just the anchors, you can imagine the size of this footing. And just to give you a sense of scale, there's a person inside the anchors and then here's them setting the post on the anchors themselves. Um, here is, um, I like this detail, um, because they, they're using the anchors to resist the overturning, but these little kind of tapered elements, they're fail-safes. So if something happened to this post 
and worst case, it failed or it exceeded the loads that we were expecting on it, our biggest worry is that these foundations fail. Um, and if the foundations fail, we have a much bigger job to replace this system. There's also the fact that dynamic loads, um, when things fail and break or release, um, that energy gets dissipated. So why might we want a fail safe on something like this? Well, you can imagine that if this stays, well, this is unfortunate because it is going to fall on this crash test dummy. Um, but if that stayed rigid, the car would have kept going and might have actually fully wrapped itself around that pole. So there are a few reasons why we might have fail safes on things. So the image that um, I showed you for the um, Lawrence Orton Park that there was a lamp post that I didn't design the base for. Um, some product suppliers actually supply their own bases as well. Um, they're often a precast element. Um, the, the benefit there is that they cast the element in the shop. So their templating and their anchor pour points are absolutely perfect. Remember those anchors are doing a big job trying to pull up out of the concrete. Um, we don't want to mess with their, their placement in our concrete element. I will often tell um, and write in my description that those anchors need to be templated. Um, so they need a piece of steel or maybe even the actual base plate that will be welded onto um, uh, our steel base. Um, they need a template placed there to hold those anchors in place while the concrete is being poured so that they will be in the perfect placement when they come to set you can see you can see from that one with the with the 400 foot flagpole that you want those to be perfect. You don't want one anchor slightly out of place, or else that's not going to slip down onto those anchors. So these ones would be in the absolute perfect placement because they were done in a shop and they could be rigorously controlled. the uh, The hard part with um, the precast um, foundations is now you have to dig a bigger hole. You can't just core down and remove your soil locally, often it means you have to follow the rules for a seven to 10 slope, which means, you know, if this is eight feet deep, uh, you can only dig a vertical cut four feet and here's your base. So we would probably be a little bit bigger. We'd have to go up four feet with a vertical base and then dig back at seven to 10. So your opening could be massively bigger than this footing here, just to put in white one light standard. Um, and then that all needs to be filled back in um, in some way and ensuring that there's kind of free draining stuff around the system. So these aren't used as often um, as you think. Um, I've been seeing them on a few projects lately, um, but often I don't even get talked to about them. Um, that, uh, that those ERA projects, um, where they had those lights, they already had a product um, and they just asked me to do the ones that didn't already come with a product base. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on inside the light standard, here are those anchors. This comes down, sometimes this might even be the template that they provide that gets supplied right to the site. Um, and then they attach it here um, and then they'd screw down into these anchors that are built into the base plate. So sometimes they have kind of two a two-part system for this. There's often holes in these things to allow electrical to run up them. Here's one where it looks like the anchors might not have been cast in the correct location. Um, so this was fabricated in a way to allow them to put the light where they needed to. Here's one of those precast post bases being installed. Um, you can see that this one, they probably didn't need to go down that far, um, but you can see that they disturbed much more of the soil and now they have to backfill in around it. Remember, this soil is critical for stopping our light from overturning, so that needs to be compacted and tight around that post base. So, that's really kind of all I wanted to talk to you about post bases. Kind of the big things I want you to take away is that we need to know 
what the wind loads are impacting our system. So if there are product, uh, a, a supplier kind of designed element, we need the EPA or the effective projected area. Um, we need to know wind information. We need to know weights information. Um, and typically these are resolved by sauna tube foundations, um, whether they're precast or designed by us. Um, and we need soil in its place to resist those loads. Um, we need to go down four feet for frost, and we often don't account for the top four feet of soil. That's definitely not what I'm making up now. Um, so that sums up lecture four. We're gonna to try to film um, the fabric one as soon as possible. Don't forget that starting tomorrow, you will have access to your assignment. Um, it is a series of 25 questions they're not difficult questions. Every single one is in the lecture slides in some way. Um, you have a week to do it, so don't rush. Don't think you have a timed limit on that. If you haven't fully submitted by the deadline, it will submit for you. Um, but take your time, go through those questions individually, really think about them. Each one is 1% of your term. Um, so really stop and think, um, communicate with each other, um, this isn't supposed to be about trying to make you fail. It's about trying to find a way that we can virtually um, show that I've provided you some technical information because that will be asked from me in the next accreditation series. Um, they did want us to have more technical courses um, in the elective series. Um, so this is a means to represent that. But I'm not trying to make you fail. That isn't the goal of this. Um, I'm not trying to make quick trick questions. The answers are there. So if you don't know what it is right away, go back to that lecture, read it through, take a look at the slide, stop and understand what the question is asking, and you should be able to do really well on that assignment. Um, I haven't looked at the part one of the project yet. I apologize. I am absolutely overwhelmed at the moment. Um, I am imagining that they're all pretty good based on the few questions I've gotten from students, um, but I will take a look at those. I'm trying to decide how to give feedback um, and if feedback is necessary or if maybe me doing kind of a quick summation of um, what you were looking at is the best way to handle it. I'll know more when I look at all of those projects. Um, so uh, we'll touch base soon, team.